Taylor Johnson, Associate Director of Middle School Ministries, and I'm so excited to welcome you today to UPC. In this series called Lord of the Psalms, we'll be following King David, our spiritual guide, as he shows us how to live a healthy spiritual life. Each week, as we study the book of Psalms, we'll get a chance to see how David expresses his deepest heart before God. We will follow David's example as we grow an intimate relationship with our Lord, who knows us and loves us. All praise and glory be to God for His sovereignty over every aspect of our lives. Now, we want to invite you to engage in the Book of Psalms with us throughout this series by going to upc.org psalms. There you'll find sermons, Talk Back Tuesdays, a devotional guide, and more. Now, I want to point you to some tips for worshiping online with us. In the description section below this video, where you see the UPC logo, when you click Show More, you'll find links to more information on UPC, like how do you connect and engage with our UPC community through small groups or following us on social media. We also want to invite you to sign into our live chat so you can engage with each other through worship. We are so glad and excited that you're here with us today and that we get to learn more about King David and the Psalms. Hello, church. My name is Tim Snow. I'm one of the pastors here at University Presbyterian Church, and I want to welcome you to worship today. For the past seven weeks, we've had the privilege of hearing from Pastor Aaron Williams as he's led us through the Psalms. Uh, today, we have the final sermon in that series, The Lord of the Psalms. It's been a real gift, hasn't it, this summer to see different beautiful places all over the state of Washington as we've worshiped God together. And as we end this summer time, we also welcome in this new season, uh, we welcome our senior pastor back from his study leave and his vacation time. He's been hard at work planning sermons for next year and getting a little break as well. Next Sunday, uh, he will be uh, beginning a new sermon series that will focus on the Ten Commandments and Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of those commandments, the fulfillment of the law. So if you stay around to the end of the service today, uh, you'll hear from George about the vision God has given him for UPC uh, this year. Well, it's fall, isn't it? And that means it's time to be back at school. Uh, and students and teachers and parents too are going back to school, back to class this week, at least virtually. Uh, and COVID-19 has changed it all, hasn't it? Our, our school supply lists are full of masks and hand sanitizers and Wi-Fi hotspots and technology. Um, unlike last year. Uh, and while we don't know what this school year brings completely, we do know that we serve a mighty God and we know that he can bring extraordinary things, it, even through teaching and learning, uh, even remotely. And that's our prayer, isn't it? As we continue in worship today, I want to remind you that we uh, have uh, a team of people praying for you during this service. And if you'd like someone to pray for you specifically, just send uh, your request via email to prayer at upc.org. We also have a team of spiritual advisors standing by to, during the service to counsel you regarding uh, your relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, simply uh, go to upc.org slash Jesus and click the link provided to connect with an advisor. Now we come to our time of offering in our, in our service. And for me, looking back on the different times and seasons of UPC and all the years I've served here, which has been many decades, we've gone through all kinds of different economic times. And I'm humbled and I'm grateful for God's incredible faithfulness uh, through your financial support of our church uh, as we try to live out our mission together. I mean, as we live in this time of pandemic, challenge, it brings up lots of things for us. Uh, it brings up fear or doubts or discouragements or loneliness or, or gratitude as well. Uh, but our faith community is a strong community and we lift each other up to the Lord and together we renew our confidence in God. I mean, our hope is not changed by a pandemic. Uh, it is a sure hope, even in times that are unsure. So as we take time for our offering moment today, uh, we're grateful for each of you um, for your contribution to shared ministry, which keeps our church going and financially stable. We wanna thank you especially for that. There are three ways to give uh, to UPC that are fairly straightforward. One is online at upc.org give. 
Another is by texting the letters UPC to 77977 and then following the prompts and instructions or by sending a check to the church at the address of the church. Let's pray together as we bring our lives and our offerings to the Lord. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have in you that does not change even by a pandemic. It's a sure hope even in times that are unsure. And so, Lord, we offer you our tithes and our gifts, and we pray that they will honor you as we live out your kingdom mission. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey there, church. How are you guys doing? I hope you're doing well today. Uh, you find us out here in Elliott Bay at the Elliott Bay Marina. Uh, it's good to be back in Seattle. Um, I'm going to lead us in some songs, a few songs that we're going to sing together. And I just want to invite you to get into a, a posture of worship, whatever that looks like for you. If you're uh, watching this in your living room, uh, if you're with your family, you're with your roommates, um, wherever you're coming from. Join in, sing out, uh, stand if you want, move if you want. Um, let's participate together as the church all over the city, all over our state. Um, we're going to sing together. This first song speaks of our testimony that we have in Jesus. And it goes like this. I saw Satan fall like lightning And I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over Is my name is registered in heaven And I believe in signs and wonders And I have resurrection power but the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life This grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony, this is my testimony, oh, 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 oh. All right, church, let's come together. Let's sing this out. So come together, sons and daughters. The bought with blood and washed with water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Our God will finish what He started This is our testimony from death to life His grace rewrote our story, we'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, we're justified. This is our testimony. This is our testimony. Oh, 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 oh. Let's declare this together. If I'm not dead, you're not done Cause greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done and Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done and Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not dying. 
greater things are still to come. This is our testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote our story, we'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, we're justified. This is our testimony, this is our testimony. Whoa, oh, 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 The kindness of heaven is here in your presence. You move with compassion, you reach out and pull me closer. The river of mercy, a stream never ending. The strength of your love will carry me. Who can stand again? My God has strong and open hands that cover me in mercy, that cover me in mercy. And out of the ashes, eternity promise, extravagant goodness and patience abundant. I've been forgiven, my failures forgotten. The strength of your love will carry me. Who can stand against my God as strong and open hands? To cover me in mercy, to cover me in mercy. Compassion, forgiveness, the strength in my weakness, devoted, sufficient, your love bridge the distance. Compassion, forgiveness, my strength in my weakness, devoted, sufficient, your love bridge the distance. Compassion, forgiveness, your strength in my weakness, devoted, sufficient, your love bridge the distance. And oh, what kindness in your presence, my salvation. Oh, who can stand against my God has strong and open hands to cover me in mercy, to cover me in mercy, to cover me in mercy. Oh, they cover me in mercy. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your strong and your open hands. Thank you that they reach out and that they, they pull us in, they draw us close, that they cover us in mercy. mercy after mercy after mercy. You pour out your grace upon grace upon grace. God, we ask that you would forgive us for the times that we don't live up to what it means to be your children. We're grateful for your grace and mercy. 
just say thank you. You stood before creation Carried the cross for my shame A sin weighed upon your shoulders A soul now to stand You stood before creation Sing that again. Carried the cross for my shame. My sin, my sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now to stay. Sing this out. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all. Of the one who gave it all, I'll stand. My soul, Lord, to you surrendered all. I am is yours. So what could I say? What could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So what could I say? What could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So we stand, we stand, we stand. So we stand with arms high and heart abandoned in our of the one who gave it all. So we stand, our souls, Lord, to you surrendered all. We have is yours. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is kids and welcome back to our backyard bible story time i'm miriam and i'm so glad you're here today can you remember a time when you made a bad choice maybe you broke an important rule or didn't share something with your brother or sister maybe you said something rude to a friend at school or ignored your mom or dad when they told you to feed the cat or clean your room what if just as you're about to hear your punishment the person you wronged said that's okay i forgive you do you know what forgive means forgive means that you get a second chance and won't be punished for what you did i wonder how it would make you feel if you were forgiven I bet it would make you feel really happy and really grateful and it would make you want to do something nice for that person. I can remember a time that I made a bad choice. One time I saw some candy, just like this candy sitting on a table. It was my sister's and I knew that I shouldn't take it, but I took it anyways. 
Then I felt really bad. I felt bad because I knew I had stolen from my sister and I also felt bad because I knew that if I told my sister that I had taken it, I'd be in big trouble and get sent to my room. But what if when I told my sister, she didn't get mad at me and she forgave me and said I didn't have to be punished? I would feel really grateful and I would really thank her. But what if when I told my sister that I had taken the candy, she forgave me and said that I didn't have to go to my room? I would feel really grateful and I would really thank her. If we ask Jesus to forgive us, he will. Jesus is so happy to forgive us when we are sorry and ask him. Jesus loves us so much and wants to rescue us from punishment. This is part of the great rescue plan we have been talking about all summer. The relief I feel when I'm forgiven helps me want to thank Jesus. It makes me want to follow him and make better choices. This is my Bible, and today's story can be found in Luke chapter 7. It shows us how happy we can feel when Jesus forgives us. Jesus was invited to dinner at an important person's house. Just as Jesus and the other guests had sat down to eat, a woman walked in. She was not invited, and the important people knew that she had made bad choices in the past. They were not pleased to see her. But then the woman did something very interesting. She bent down to Jesus' feet and began to cry. She washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried his feet with her hair. Then she broke open a bottle of very expensive perfume and poured it all over Jesus' feet. Look at the important people. They look very angry and shocked. They thought, Jesus knows who this woman is and the bad choices she has made. He will not like what she is doing and he will ask her to leave. Do you think that's what happened? Do you think Jesus frowned and asked this woman to leave? Or do you think Jesus understood how much this woman wanted forgiveness and rescued her by forgiving her? I wonder. I also wonder what Jesus is going to say to the important people who are watching this all happen. I can't wait for you to find out what happens. You can find today's Bible story at our website at upc.org slash kids. You can also find a video of this story. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for forgiving us. Thank you that we don't have to worry whether you love us or not when we make bad choices. Thank you for rescuing us from punishment. We are so thankful. We love you and we want to serve you. Amen. Have an awesome Sunday and we hope to see you next week. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to glorify you, to be people who build up and encourage each other and our neighbors so that we all might share the hope that you, we have in you. Lord, help us to be people who love our family well. Help us to be people who love our church well and help us to be people who love our neighbors well. Lord, we pray for justice. We pray for civility. We pray for respect. We pray for encouragement. Lord, change each of us so that we might live better into these values, these things. And Lord, we pray for all the students and teachers and parents that are starting back to school in the midst of this pandemic. We pray for support and, and supported virtual learning as and that it would go well and that it would be effective and encouraging. We pray for schools that will be doing some in-classroom work as well. We pray that you keep the students and teachers and staff safe. Lord, encourage parents, especially as they navigate all of this along with so many other responsibilities. And Lord, as we think of our world, we think of those devastated by hurricanes and fires and huge explosions. We pray for practical relief, for help in tangible ways as some face complete rebuilds of their community. Lord, we pray for your care and mercy that these families would know you close at hand. Lord, we pray for Cheryl and her family as they grieve the loss of her mother, Dorothy and for Anne and Larry Robinson as they continue to grieve the loss of their son, Todd. And we lift Todd's three sons to you especially. May they know the comfort and hope that they have in you, that we all have in you, as they experience that loss and continue to grieve. Lord, I pray for Denise uh, that her unemployment will go through and for peace as she waits to start school in person again. 
for Don Wu facing back surgery, Lord, bring him relief from the pain and, he, and heal his body. And Lord, for, for Julie and Juan as they proceed with IVF this week, may it be effective, Lord, and bring them peace and encouragement as they wait for healthy children. For all those battling illness, Lord, each of us know many people. Uh, we, we lift them to you right now, Lord, and we ask that you would be healing uh, their lives and be a healing presence in their lives. And now, Lord, continue to teach us to pray as we pray the prayer you taught with. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them, Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we're out here on Elliott Bay, in case you're wondering where we are, in the Puget Sound, and I have the city of Seattle skyline behind me, and to my left is the beautiful, majestic Mount Rainier. And uh, we're on a beautiful sailboat called the Solstice uh, that is owned by Dean and Carolyn Iwata. And we want to thank them for uh, sharing uh, their boat with us. And the boat is rocking a little bit. The water is moving the boat. And as, we, as we're here on the boat and it's moving, I'm reminded of the power of God. In the African-American tradition, we sing a song called, Everything is Moving by the Power of God. Today, I want to 
talk to you from Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is a creation psalm. Uh, it's attributed to David. Uh, you know, David has been our spiritual guide uh, during these series on the Psalms, the Lord of the Psalms. And I want to hang as a title over this psalm, The Mindfulness of God, The Mindfulness of God. I want to read verse, verse 1 and 2 uh, to you, and we're going to just talk about what God, what God, who God is and what God has done. Uh, when we read Psalm 8, Psalm 8 is about praising God. And what I love about David in this psalm is he directly praises God. So we're enjoying this beautiful sunset and looking at what God is able to do to keep the sun in its place. Mount Rainier has been very quiet since 1981. God has kept Mount Rainier quiet in that peace. So I want to read Psalm 8 to you. It says, O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. You know, Psalm 8 is a poetic expression of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And what David is doing is reflecting on the creation. He's reflecting on Genesis 1 and he's putting into poetic expression what God did in the beginning. And not only what God has done in the beginning, but what God has done and he continues to sustain everything that he creates. And so he says here, David says, O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What I'm amazed about is the mindfulness of the psalmist. That the psalmist realized that he's in a covenant relationship with God. And not only is he in a covenant relationship, but we are in a covenant relationship with God. And that word Lord is the word Yahweh. And that's God's covenant keeping name. When Moses went to Egypt and he went to Pharaoh, Moses asked the Lord, Lord, who shall I tell them who sent me? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And what he was really saying to Moses, he says, tell Pharaoh that I am that I am, I'm the beginning and I'm the ending. I'm everything that sustains the universe. So that's a covenant keeping name. It des describes God's relationship to humanity. And then he says, our sovereign. The word sovereign comes from the Hebrew word Adonai, which means almighty, sovereign one. And then it carries with it the idea that God is majestic, that he's awesome, that he's God all by himself, that God keeps everything and he sustains everything by his words. So brothers and sisters, I think many times this concept of sovereign is at tension with humanity today. What I mean by that is that there is what we call the sovereign self, that many times humanity gets, begins to think that he or she is bigger than God. And God has to remind humanity that he's the sovereign one. He's the one who sits high and looks low, but he's the one that sustains everything in the world. It says, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How mighty is your name, Lord? How great is your name? There is no name greater than yours. One translation says, Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. 
that the animals know that God is majestic, that everything that God created from the beginning knows that God's name is excellent. God wants us as humanity to recognize that his name is mighty, that his name is significant, and his name is excellent. He says, you have set your glory above the heavens. In other words, God has established his glory. He has established who he is, that God is glorious all by himself. He doesn't need humanity to make him look good. This word really means God is intrinsically glorious by himself. He doesn't have to put on any makeup. He doesn't have to put on anything to make himself look good. That God is glorious all by himself. And that's good news, brothers and sisters, that God doesn't need, need our help to look good. He looks good all by himself. And then there's a beautiful expression in Psalm 2, in Psalm 8, verse 2, he says, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have found it a bulwark. Now, that's an interesting word because we don't use that word anymore. anymore. That's an archaic word, but what it really means, a stronghold, that you have established something strong that, that will protect us, that will guide us. And then he goes on to say, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the uh, avenger. Now, this is an interesting verse. It, it points out the fact Jesus used this verse in Matthew 21, where he said, out of the mouths of babes, Lord, you have perfected praise. What this really means in our relationship to God, that when we praise God, uh, when we when we lift up the name of God, it creates a stronghold around us. It creates protection around us. When we call on the name of God, when we praise him, it arouses the heart of God. You know, as we made our way out here to Elliott Bay, uh, we had to go through the dock where all the boats and yachts and sailboats were situated. And there was an area of, of rocks, a barricade of rocks called breakwater. And I asked Carolyn, what's the purpose of, what is, what is a breakwater? She said to me, this is what keeps the water in the docking area at peace and keep it quiet. It keeps the, the rushing water, when the water gets busy out here, it keeps uh, the water from getting into the, the dock and it creates peace right there in the boating dock. And I thought about that. I said, that's what God does. That's what this bulwark of praise means is that when we praise God, God creates an inner peace where, where the waves and tides of life don't come in and it brings peace to our own lives. Brothers and sisters, we God is our breakwater. He's the one that gives us peace. He's the one that gives us a sense of his presence and gives us a sense of his awe. And I want you to stay with us as we continue to, to go through this Psalm, Psalm 8. And we're going to talk a little bit, little bit more about the mindfulness of God. Amen. Amen. Here we are on the campus of the University of Washington. And as we stand here, I'm reminded that in 1908, First Presbyterian Church planted a little small church 
called University Presbyterian Church for the sole purpose of reaching out to the University of Washington. And that in itself tells me that back in 1908 that there were a group of men and women who were mindful of humanity, that they wanted to minister to students and professors. And so they planted a church in close proximity to the University of Washington so that we could minister, share the gospel with students years to come. And here we are in 2020, and University of Presbyterian Church is still ministering to college students, university students from the University of Washington. And as I think about, think about that, and I think about Psalm 8, because Psalm 8 talks about the mindfulness of God. And when we talk about the mindfulness of God, we cannot help but talk about the mindfulness of God's people. Because this is really what Psalm 8 tells us, is that not only was God mindful, but he, he delegated responsibility to humanity. And he delegated responsibility later on to the church that we would be just as mindful as he is. And so I want to continue this discussion because one of the things we see in Psalm 8 is that we've got to continually rehearse who God is and what God has done. We've got to rehearse who God is, that God is sovereign, that God is omnipotent, that God is omniscient, he's all wise, because it gives us a sense as human beings who we are when we rehearse who God is. So you constantly see David, the psalmist, rehearsing who God is. And so even in this 21st century, we must continue to, that same practice of who God is. Now look at what David says here in verse two, which is a very interesting verse. He says, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. Now, we don't use that word, word bulwark anymore, but it literally means stronghold. God established a stronghold, a, a, a position of strength. And Jesus uses this same passage in Matthew 21, where he says that God has perfected praise out of the mouths of children and babes. And what it implies is that God chooses the weak things of this world to confound the wise, to confound those who are proud. That God is able to choose even a child to perfect his praise. Now, this could be possible that this passage is also referring to the posture of humility, God's humanity, that God has created a posture of humility in each and every one of his children. And so David points out this fact that God chooses the, the insignificant things, the small things that, of this world to confound the wise. He has established a, a stronghold, a bulwark of praise, if you will. And what it really implies, brothers and sisters, is that many times praise confuses the enemy. That when we praise God, even in the midst uh, of, of chaos, even in the midst of disorientation, when we praise God, the enemy gets confused because he can't rationalize why we would praise God. So we see here that David says, you have set your glory above the heavens. You have established your glory above the heavens. And this, this word glory, and when we talk about glory, we have to talk about what it means to us and what it means in, 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 in relationship to God. That glory, that God is glorious in and of himself. He doesn't need anything to make himself more glorious. And we call that intrinsic glory. 
uh, that God is beautiful. He's altogether lovely all by himself. God is awesome all by himself. But as finite creatures, we have to ascribe glory to ourselves. We have to put on something. We have to wear something to make ourselves look glorious. That's ascribed glory. But God has has intrinsic glory in and of himself. And when God does something, uh, he establishes it in such a way uh, that man can't tear it down. And so this is what the psalmist says. This is what David says. You have set your glory above the heavens. Then David begins to delineate in what, what God has done in creation. Not only does he talk about who God is, that God is sovereign, uh, that God is awesome, that God is majestic, but then he begins to talk about what God has done. He says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, So David looks around and he says, Lord, when I look at the heavens, when I look at the trees, when I look at what you have done in nature and I see the work of your fingers. This this is an interesting word because David is using anthropomorphic language to describe the work of God. Now, we also see this, uh, this analogy or this imagery in Genesis and we also see it in Exodus that God, God, God's divine faint finger wrote the, the commandments, uh, what Moses says in Exodus. And that he also, that the third plague, plague in Exodus was initiated by the finger of God. And so here we see, uh, he says, the work of your fingers, which it, it, it describes the power of God. God doesn't need his hands to do the work. His fingers can do the work. And so he talks about the power of God that when he looks at the moon and the stars that you have established. And then in verse four, this is the the centerpiece of Psalm eight. He says, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? What of human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? What what a beautiful expression. That's the question that David asks. He says, Lord, when I look at myself, I'm compared to the universe. I'm like a speck of dust. And what are human beings, Lord, that you are mindful of them? And this word mindful means that God pays attention to us. That God's, God's mind is full with thoughts of humanity. And we see this in scriptures that God wants to be in relationship with humanity. That God wants to be in relationship with all of humanity. And so here he says, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? And mortals that you care for them. God is the divine caregiver of humanity. That when we look at creation, that creation was created for us to enjoy. As when we think about that the chief end of man is to enjoy God and and serve him forever, to worship him forever. And so here we see David talk about the mindfulness of God. That God takes great intentionality, great intentionality and cares for humanity. God, that we are the apple of God's eye, that we are precious in his sight. God is concerned about humanity. And then he says in verse five, yet you have made them a little lower than God. Now, this is what the NRSV, that you have made them a little lower than God. Some translation says you have made them a little lower than the angels, which implies that every human being has some God stuff in them, that every human being has a spark of divinity in them, uh, that we are created in the 
image of God, that God chose humanity to reflect his image, to reflect his character. We are called image bearers of God. And that that calling, that, that, that calling, that title on us to be made in the image of God means that we have some responsibility, that we are like God, and God has given us some responsibility that is God-like. And so I, I, wanna, I want you to walk with me. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, about what this means to be made in the image of God. We've been talking about the mindfulness of God over creation. That God took great intentionality in creating the universe. Sun, moon, the stars. And I might even add the birds. God took very much, he was very much in tune with what he created and connected with what he created. But then there is another aspect of the mindfulness of God, and that is the mindfulness of God with humanity. And Psalm 8, verse 4 says, What are human beings that you are mindful of them, and mortals that you care for them? We mentioned earlier that God is the divine caregiver of humanity, that God cares for humanity, even in the midst of the fallenness of humanity, he still cares. He's still reaching out, extending his, his hand of grace to humanity. But I want us to also understand when we think about God's care for humanity, God also created humanity, every man woman, boy, or girl, in his image, that we are all image bearers of God. And that has profound implications because that tells us that every human being, whether they're saved or not, they are image bearers of God. And we have a responsibility that that responsibility that God gave to the first humans, Adam and Eve, in the Garden Garden of Eden did not stop there. God still wants us to be good stewards over his creation. And here we are uh, on Greek Row around these beautiful homes, midst of cars and houses, students learning and so forth. But there's a sense of disorientation here at the University of Washington. There's a sense of di disorientation here in Greek Row. But even in the midst of disorientation, God says, I'm still there. I'm still reaching out to humanity. I'm still extending my grace and mercy to every human being. And I know sometimes when we look around us, we find that hard to believe. But I do believe that God keeps the enemy at bay. Many times the enemy wants to wreak havoc. He wants to totally destroy things. God in his grace and mercy and his loving kindness continues to extend his arm of grace. His hand is of grace. Let us look at verse 6. He says, you have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. This word dominion carries with it the idea that God has put us in charge of his created order. God has given us responsibility. God calls us to be environmentally conscious of his creation, to care for it, 
to be extensions of his hands, to be extension of his feet, to be an extension of his heart, to be environmentally conscious of his creation. And so God has, in some way, this, this is a royal term. This word dominion means that it, it carries with it the idea of royalty. And in a real sense, God has made each and every human being kings and queens of his creation. That we are called to rule over, but not just to rule, but to rule with the idea of caring for humanity and caring for his creation. Now, we have been moving in this whole series from, uh, from nature, and today we have moved back to the city and back to our own neighborhood. The University of Presbyterian Church is just a block from where we are right now. And brothers and sisters, that was intentional because we said from the very beginning that God wrote two books. He wrote Nature, and he wrote the Bible, and it's important that we read both books. And so throughout this series, we have moved from nature, and today we have moved back into the city. Intentionally, we have moved back into the city because humanity is the crowning glory of God's creation. As a matter of fact, we are right here on Greek Row, which is just a block away from the church. And here we are, around these homes, around these cars, and, and the noise sounds different than it did in nature. We heard birds in nature, but now we hear cars in the city. And brothers and sisters, God has called us to be just as in tune uh, with humanity here in the city, because God has called us to reach out to humanity, to reach out to be connected to humanity, because God did not die for buildings. He died for humanity. God did not give his son for possessions. He gave his son for every human being. So as we stand here today, we as human beings and as Christians, God has called us to mimic the mindfulness of God, to be mindful of his creation, but to be mindful of every human being that every human being is precious in God's sight. You know, I like what H.G. Wells said. He said, unless a man knows God, he begins at no beginning and works toward no end. And that tells us that man search for God until he finds God. He begins at no beginning. He hasn't even begun to live until he knows who God is. And this is what David is saying to us in the psalm. Oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He's saying that God, we've got to know you better because once we know who God is, we begin to know who we are. We have a more, a more profound sense of who we are. I remember when I first started preaching uh, my grandmother, before Uber ever existed, my grandmother made me an Uber driver. I used to drive her to church, and she thought I was just her personal Uber driver. And on one occasion, you know, I guess I was such a great driver with her, she recommended that I pick, well, she didn't recommend to me. She actually said, I need you to pick this lady up and take her to church. And this lady's name was Miss Johnson. And we had, we developed a relationship. She was in her 80s. And I would take her to church to sing one solo. One solo. And she would sing this one song, How Great Thou Art. And she would sing that song with so much power, so much passion. And every Sunday, she would call me and I would take her to another church to sing How Great Thou Art. Uh, that was like there was no other song in the hymn book for Miss Johnson. That was the song that Miss Johnson wanted to sing. And I asked her one day, Miss Johnson, why, why do you sing How Great Thou Art with every church we go to? And she said to me that day, and I'll never forget it. She said, people need to know how great God is 
that people need to know how good God is, that people need to know how awesome God is. She began to share her testimony with me. And when I asked her that question, she began to share with me how God had brought her, how God had protected her. And she said, with every breath that I have, I'm going to sing how great thou art. And that's what David is saying in Psalm 8. David says, I know, I know you love Psalm 23. I know you love Psalm 1, but I'm here to declare how great God is, how excellent is his name in all the earth. David says, there's only one song that I really want to get across, and I want to get across the awesomeness and the love and the majesty of God. And this is what David says to us in this psalm. God is great. God is awesome. And so God wants us to mimic his mindfulness. Mimic his mindfulness in the 21st century. What does that say to us today? That God is mindful of humanity. That he's mindful of black and brown people. That he's mindful of George Floyd. That he's mindful of Breonna Taylor. That he's mindful of of Ahmaud Arbery, that he's mindful of Jacob Blake, that God is mindful of the disenfranchised. He's mindful of the marginalized in society. God is mindful of every human being. But right now we need to understand today that God is mindful of those people, of people who we have failed and recognized their humanity. You now I think of the story of the police chief in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they asked him the question, you know, how do you process all of this and, and what happened to George Floyd? And he said, humanity failed George Floyd, that we failed to recognize his humanity. Brothers and sisters, as Christians, God wants us not to fail humanity, but to recognize that every human being has been created in the image of God. So let us practice the mindfulness of God today. Let us practice the mindfulness of God because people still need to know who God is. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Psalm 8, and we thank you for the psalmist. We thank you for David, who reminds us of who God is and what God has done. We thank you, dear God, that God loved us so much one day that he gave his one and only son, that if we believe in him, we shall not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you, dear God, that you have given us the awesome responsibility of practicing the mindfulness of God, to be intentional, to pay attention to humanity, to pay attention to the lost, to pay attention to the homeless, to pay attention to black and brown people, to pay, pay attention, dear God, to what's going on in society because at the end of the day, it's about humanity, dear God, that you loved humanity so much that you gave your one and only son. And so, Lord God, help us as a church during the season of new orientation, to be mindful of every human being and to reflect the character of Christ to them. Lord, we thank you. We give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, as we bring this series to a close, and as we think about the journey that God has had us on. And certainly God has brought us from orientation to disorientation and to this new season of new orientation to thank God for what he's done. Now, if you are a member of UPC, I just want you to make a, to recommit yourself to thinking differently, to thinking higher, to thinking the thoughts of God and being mindful of humanity. But if you're not a member of UPC, if you're not a believer, 
I want you to know today, Jesus was mindful of you one day. When, you, when he was on the cross, he had you on his mind. He had nails in his hands, crown of thorns on his head, and nails in his feet. He had you on his mind. And that's why I'm standing here today because Christ has been drawing you to himself. Even at this very moment, he's drawing you to himself. And if you feel that tug in your heart, don't ignore it. Don't allow the enemy to talk you out of not accepting Jesus Christ. But I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I ask that Jesus will come into my life. And I ask, Father, that you will forgive me for my sins. And I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, I celebrate with you. Because Jesus has indeed come into your life. Now there's a website on the screen, at the bottom of the screen, upc.org slash Jesus. I want you to go to that website. And there's some prayer warriors. There's some spiritual advisors waiting on you to walk with you. Because we believe as a church, it takes a church to raise a Christian. And we want you to become a part of our family. And most importantly, a part of God's family. And we thank God for you that you made that decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Good to see you. <laughs> it's, great to, it's great to be back. Thank you for your ministry this summer. What a wonderful sermon series it's been. You have raised the bar so high. Well, thank you, Pastor George. It's been my pleasure. But I'm glad to have you back, buddy. And, well, it's good to be back. But you have taken us on a journey from Chambers Bay to Mount Si, Hurricane Ridge. Um, it's so beautiful. One day, my wife and I went out to Franklin Falls oh, to wow. get a taste of that. But and the Lord of the Psalms, I feel like I, uh, I know him better after uh, your preaching and this series. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, my name is George Hinman. I'm the senior pastor here at UPC, colleague to Pastor Aaron. And I wanna thank you for the ability to have some time away. I, if you're new here, I've been away for several weeks to plan and also to refresh a little bit. I was able to introduce myself to a dozen or so trout uh, glorious time, so thank you for that. But I'm really glad to be back. I'm glad to be with you. I'm looking forward to actually seeing you. Um, as I come back, I have a sense of urgency. It really feels like with everything that's going on right now, you know, we have a mission. Uh, Jesus wants to transform our lives and the lives of our neighbors. Here we are in the neighborhood that God put us in in 1908. Uh, Christians moved into this neighborhood in order to join Jesus in his mission to transform the lives of people. And uh, to this day, he's been faithful to do that. And it just feels like now more than ever, this is what is needed for followers of Jesus Christ to say, hey, we're his and we want you to come and join us. So uh, we're praying for 206 new people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as you invited us to say yes to Jesus, uh, we want to 
continue to share that invitation both in our worship services and through our formational communities throughout the neighborhoods of Seattle. So I wanna invite you to join us. Please pray for 206 people to know the life transforming love of God in Jesus Christ. That might be you. Uh, it might be one of your neighbors, but this is what we're gonna be about in the year to come. Now, we start a new sermon series. We're gonna go back inside video wise and uh, a series called 10, Living the Jesus Way. We're gonna take a look at the 10 commandments. We're gonna ask what relevance do they have for followers of Jesus Christ? They're not about God trying to uh, prevent us from something. They're actually about God trying to protect something for us. They're about freedom, about being set free. Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior said, uh, if you're my disciple, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I'm looking forward to joining you on that journey. It starts next week, 10, living the Jesus way. Um, but it's been a great hour of worship. Thank you again, Pastor Aaron. Would you close our time of worship? Absolutely. Let us receive the benediction. Father, we thank you for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. And we thank you, dear God, for the journey that you have us on and that we're drawing forever and ever closer to you in our relationship with you. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide within us, now henceforth and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you.